See, and people will be out there that want to steal your dreams, that want to discourage you, and the reason they want to do that is they don't want you to win. The problem is a lot of people get their dreams stolen. And he introduced me and he said, I want to tell a story before I put Jack on. He said, the story goes like this. When I was a high school student, there was a kid in my class who was an itinerant that moved around in the back of a truck. His dad was a trainer, and he never lived anywhere more than a couple of months. He would never go to school anywhere more than a couple of months. And he had this dream, though. He wanted to grow up and race thoroughbred racing horses. And the teacher at this school, when he was there, asked the kids to write a paper. They said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he got very excited because this was a chance to really go for his dream. So he wrote down, I want to raise thoroughbred racing horses. And he drew a diagram of a 200-acre ranch. And he drew a diagram of a 4,000-square-foot house where all the rooms would be. And on the ranch, he had the racetrack and where the tack room would be and the bunkhouses and the central administration office and all this stuff. And he was very excited. And he handed it in. And he got it back a week later and said, F, see me after class. Well, he was shocked. He'd poured his heart into this. And he went up to the teacher. He said, how come I got an F? What's the deal? And he said, I'll tell you why you got an F. You're a poor kid living off the back of a truck. Do you know what land costs in this valley? Do you know what it costs for breeding stock and for stud fees? This is an unrealistic dream for a young man like you. There's no way you could ever achieve this. And it's my job as a teacher to make sure you don't grow up and be disappointed. So I want you to write a more realistic dream for yourself, and I'll give you a higher grade. Well, he went home, and he talked to his dad. And he said, Dad, what should I do? And his dad said, well, I can't tell you what to do. It's your life. But I will tell you this. Whatever you decide is probably going to affect the rest of your life, so think hard about it. Well, he thought, and he thought, and he thought. And after a week, he went back to the teacher, and he handed in the exact same paper. And he said, you can keep the F. I'm keeping my dream. Now, just like you, I got goosebumps when he told that story. And then Monty goes over to the mantle, and he pulls down a frame. And in that frame is a piece of paper. And it says in red letters, F, see me after class. And the name on the paper was Monty F. Roberts. We were in his 4,000 square foot house and his 204 acre ranch. And that year, his income was over $6 million. Now the reality is, here's a poor kid who made his dream come true. How did he do it? See, and people will be out there that want to steal your dreams, that want to discourage you. And the reason they want to do that is they don't want you to win. Because if you win and they lose, it makes them look like a loser. So they want you to kind of stay at the level of mediocrity they are. And what makes it even harder is most of our parents weren't huge dream makers. Most of us grew up in what we call middle class. Most of our parents didn't make their dreams come true. And they didn't have the skills to teach you. And so we're going to be learning here those techniques that can make your dreams come true. Now, I have a client, a corporate client called 9X, New York. I don't know what it stands for. New England Telephone 9X, whatever it is, New York something exchange. And I go up there and I do consulting with them. And I was in this office on a bulletin board. Someone had a very interesting poster. It said, this life is a test. It is only a test. If it had been an actual life, you would have received further instructions on where to go and what to do. <laughs> and I thought, that's kind of like it is, isn't it? There's not a whole lot of people that are giving us those further instructions. So tonight's about that. We're going to give you further instructions on where to go and what to do. And that's really the purpose of this seminar. Now, I spent 25 years researching people that are peak performers, people that have succeeded in sports, finance, in the business world, become top salespeople, people that have made a difference in government and politics, social reformers, people that have gone out and made a difference in the world. And what we find is that all of those people have some things in common, well, what we're going to call later disciplines of success. And every one of these things that they do, the ways they think, the actions they engage in, the behaviors that they have, these are all totally learnable. I grew up a poor kid in West Virginia, and I've made my life pretty successful. And if I can do it, you can do it. Now, it doesn't matter what your dreams are, whether it's you want to have more money, you want to have that dream house you've always dreamed of, or maybe there's that certain car you've always wished you could have, or maybe you want to have more intimacy or passion in your life, or maybe you want to be the top salesman in your company, or you want to solve social problems like illiteracy and homelessness and hunger and poverty, or maybe you want to get into the college of your choice, or maybe that special trip you've always wanted to take to China or to Italy or to California if you live on the East Coast, whatever it might be. Now, how many of you have read the book, Chicken Soup for the Soul? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, most of you, that's good. Now, that book 
When we first took that to New York, it was turned down by 33 major New York publishers. They all said, no, 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 no. Major rejection. And, you know, we thought it was a good book, but they said no violence, there's no sex, people don't buy short stories, you know, where's the hook? We said, no, these are stories that will inspire and motivate people, and we know they work because we've been doing these talks all over the country, and we get standing ovations. And they said, no, I'm sorry. So then we went to the American Booksellers Association convention. There are 4,000 booths, and we had little backpacks on with manuscripts, and we went around going, will you publish our book? 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 And everyone said, no, not interested, not interested, not interested. We talked to over 144 publishers in depth, and finally, Health Communications down in Deerfield, Florida, they said, look, give us the manuscript, we'll take it home, we'll read it on the plane, and they called us up a week later and said, we love it, we want to publish it. Now, what if we'd given up after the hundredth person and said, well, obviously this isn't supposed to happen. We would have self-published the book if no one else had, because we were committed to the vision. Now, our publisher was very excited about the book as we were, and we said, we have a goal, we want to sell 150,000 copies by Christmas. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard a grown man fall off a chair and laugh over a phone. It's not the most pleasant sight you've ever heard, you know, it's not a great sound. And he said, no, we'll be lucky to sell 20,000. We said, no, you don't understand, We're gonna, we have his dream, we have his vision. And he said, well, sorry, you know, well, it's nice, but we don't think it'll happen. Well, we didn't reach our goal, we only sold 135,000. But we were pretty excited about that. And then we said our next goal is to do a hundred, or to do a million and a half in a year and a half. And he said, well, that's really absurd. We said, no, we're going to do that. Now, we didn't meet that goal either. We did a million three. But see, the point is, without having a dream, and we're going to see as we go through this course, that having a dream and using the principles I'm going to teach you can take you from anywhere to wherever you want to go. But you've got to use the principles. Now, I make two promises in all of my seminars. Number one, every issue that's important to you, the areas where you can measure it will improve. Finances, health, relationships, sales, achievement, results, all of that. And the second promise is if you do what I teach you, you're going to have more fun in your life. Does anyone here not want to have more fun in your life? It's okay? More fun's okay? Okay, good. Now, why can I make that promise? The reason I can make the promise is this. I've done this seminar with over 100,000 people, and we get hundreds of letters a week. People, just their dreams are coming true at a fabulous rate, and just doing things that they didn't think were even possible. And I know it can happen, too, because it's happened in my life. But here's the catch. I have a friend named Jim Rohn, who's one of the great success philosophers of our time. He says, you can't hire other people to do your push-ups. So you can't hire other people to do these things I'm about to teach you. These become disciplines of success, things that you have to do. And there are things you have to do over and over and over. Things like meditate, things like pray, things like give appreciation, things like ask for what you want, things like monitor the level of your thoughts in your mind. Because if you don't do that, no one can do it for you. Just like I can't send this gentleman here to go to the doctor and get a checkup for me. It's just not possible. So the rubber meets the road where you do the work. I often say that these seminars are like motivation and inspiration. That's my job. That's pretty easy. But then there's the information you need to make it work. And then there's the perspiration. You've got to go and do the work. And so that's where it really hits the, the road traveling is you've got to go out there and do it. Number one, says you must focus more time and energy on the achievement of your dreams. See, most of us are floating through life, being pulled in every which direction, and we're not really consciously thinking about where do I want to be by when and what do I want to get done. But if we put more attention on that, there's an old phrase that says, energy flows where your attention goes. And so we want to make sure that our energy is going to follow our intention, but if we don't think about it, nothing's going to happen. Now, my mentor in this whole arena was a man named W. Clement Stone. Some of you may have heard of him. He was a self-made multimillionaire. He was the publisher of Success Magazine for a number of years. Og Mandino was his editor. This guy was a fabulous guy, one of the most dynamic gentlemen I've ever met. And he was a, uh, I think he was worth $600 million when I worked for him. And I think he was worth $800 million when I quit two years later, so you can get a sense of how his wealth was moving. And when I got a job there working for him, he said, I want to do a little intake interview with you. And I said, fine, gosh, this guy's going to talk to me. That was pretty cool. And he said, first I have a question. I said, what's that? He said, do you watch television? I said, yeah, sure. He said, well, how many hours a day do you watch? I said, well, I watch, I don't know, Good Morning America, and then I watch the news, and then maybe Johnny Carson, and about three hours a day. He said, well, I want you to cut out one hour a day. I said, okay, I'll trust you, but why? He said, because 
If you take that one hour a day and you multiply that by 365 hours, at the end of the year, or 365 days, at the end of the year, you've got 365 hours. Divide that by a 40-hour work week, you get nine and a half additional weeks of productive time. And he says, now I want that time. I said, well, what do you want me to do with it? He said, I want you to read. I want you to read in the field. I want you to read about motivation. I want you to read about stories. I want you to read about psychology. I want you to read about management. I want you to read about computer sciences. I want you to read about the media. I want you to read about this arena we're playing the game in. And he said, if you do that, you're going to become much more valuable to not only me, but to yourself. And then later I heard Jim Rohn say, if you'd read a book a week, in a year you've read 52 books, in 10 years you've read 520 books, again, in this field, we're not talking about novels here, that would make you probably in the top 1% of your profession. Because what age are we in? The information age. And most of us are sitting in a numbed out state, watching some show, we laugh and all that, but what have you really got at the end of it? And I think it's great to relax a little bit and let TV do that and watch a sports game and all that, but the problem is we get into a trance and we let our life go by. Now, maybe you don't want to read. Maybe you want to exercise, get fit. Maybe you want to spend quality time with your children. Maybe you want to meditate and pray and read the Bible. But do something that's more uplifting than what most of us are doing. The average American watches six hours of TV a day. Now, think about that. That's one-fourth of a day. That says by the time you're 60, you'll have spent 15 years watching television. <laughs> and we're on television, so I'm not trying to make TV wrong, okay? <laughs> But use it intelligently. You know, certain drugs are useful for you in terms of healing diseases, but if you overuse them, become addicted to them, then it's not to your advantage. Now, the other thing he taught me, he said, do you watch TV right before you go to bed? And I said, well, yeah. He said, that's the worst time. He said, because what are you usually watching around 11 o'clock? The news. Is that uplifting? Yeah. Not usually. Negative stuff. Rape, murder, pillage, the economy is going down. You know, all that kind of stuff. And the problem is, you're putting that in your brain right before you go to bed. What he taught me, and we've validated now since uh, we've done some psychological research on this, the last 45 minutes before you go to bed, whatever you input into your brain, through television, reading, conversation, whatever, is going to be played more times in your unconscious over the course of the night. That's why kids can cram for a test at midnight and then do well the next day. It's only short-term memory, but it will go in there. So if you're watching the news or you're having a fight or you're watching Friday the 13th part 7, you know, or whatever, that's what you're processing all night long. This is not good. What if instead you were reading a biography of a famous person, someone that had done good in the world, like Martin Luther King or John Kennedy or whoever that might be for you? Then that's what you're playing all night long, images of success in there. What if I take my day and plan it? for the next day, so all night long my unconscious is figuring out how to make that plan come true. What if I read spiritual literature so I get into a very calm, centered place before I go to sleep? What if I sit down with my wife and we tell each other what we appreciate about each other before we go to sleep, instead of having a fight or not talking at all? So there's a lot of things that you want to do at that point in time. The last thing you want to do is watch something or take something in that's negative. Now the second thing that Sohn taught me was to avoid toxic people. Do y'all know what toxic people are? And surround yourself with positive people. I have a friend who just wrote a, a book that's, that's going to be very famous called If Life is a Game, These Are the Rules. Her name's Cherie Carter Scott. And she wrote a book before that called Negaholics. People that are addicted to negativity, like an alcoholic. And then there's, I sometimes call them black holes of the universe. You know, you meet people and after 10 minutes you're like, oh God, you know, you're walking like this because they bring you down, you know. Then there are other people that bring you up. And you want to surround yourself with people that energize you, that believe in your dreams, that support you, that encourage you. What Robert Schuller calls possibility thinkers. Is this making sense? Yeah. Stone also taught me, he said, if there's something you want to do, go hang out with someone who's already done it. Because you're going to learn from them. Let's flip back a second and just look at this whole idea of surrounding yourself with positive people. One of the stories that we put in the first Chicken Soup for the Soul book was about this guy driving to work. And it was a Paul Harvey story. You all know Paul Harvey from the radio. And he said Gary Coleman was driving to work when this woman and he collided at an intersection. Not a major accident, but a fender bender. And they get out and he's relieved that it's kind of minor and she starts to cry. And he's going, why are you crying, lady? It's not that big a deal. 
She said, you don't understand. This is a new car. My husband just bought this. It's only three days out of the showroom. How am I going to explain this to him? And he says, well, look, I'm sorry. I understand this is not good, but, you know, I need to get to work. Can you get your driver's license and your registration and your insurance documents? So she says, okay. So they go over and they pull out the documents and she opens up her envelope. And on top of all the documents, a little note in her husband's handwriting. It says, in case of accident, remember, honey, it's you I love, not the car. Every time you read, ask yourself, what's the principle here? And then can I apply that to my life? If you read a whole book and only get one thing out of it and use it, over the course of years, you're going to have thousands of pieces of information that you never had before. Now, the third thing that Stone taught me is that you've got to take 100% responsibility for your life. Now, we hear that. It's not a real comfortable thing. That means you can't blame your mom and dad. You can't blame someone else's alcoholism. You can't blame the hurricane that's coming, the weather, the stars, the astrology chart, you know, the economy, whoever it is. It's called, I'm taking 100% responsibility for my life. Now, that may be an act as if. It may, maybe you're not 100% responsible. But if you act as if, you start taking control of the things you have control over. And a lot of us live in what we call victim consciousness. And part of this seminar is how to go from being a victim to being victorious how to go from being a victim to a victor, so that we're not blaming others, but learning from our mistakes, taking responsibility, and moving on. Now, I learned a principle that I would like all of you to memorize in your brain here. It's called E plus R equals O. And if you can write that down, write it down, E plus R equals O. And what that stands for is there are events in your life, you then have a response to those events, and that produces an outcome. And whenever people complain to you about an outcome that they don't like, like they're overweight, they're under budgeted, they don't have enough money, there's, uh, you know, they're not happy in their relationships, they're not physically well, whatever it might be, they usually want to blame something over here. The truth is the only thing you have any control over is your response. So if you don't like the outcomes you're getting, they're all results of earlier choices you made, earlier responses to events. Let me give you a couple examples of how this works. If I go over to you, what's your name? Jill. Jill. And I say to Jill, Jill, I've been doing these seminars for 20 years, done them in 19 countries, at least a million people that I've talked to. You have to be the biggest jerk and idiot I've ever met in my 20-year career. Now, <laughs> she just stuck her tongue out at me. Now, if I said that to Jill and meant it, how many people think that would raise her self-esteem? Can I see a show of hands? How many people think that would lower her self-esteem? Let me see hands. Almost everybody. I see you weren't listening to E plus R equals O. The event, the E, was me saying, you're the biggest jerk and idiot I've ever met. The outcome is her self-esteem is either high or low. But it's her response after I stop talking that determines how she feels, not what I say. She could say, my gosh, she's only known me 20 minutes. How'd he figure it out so fast? Right? <laughs> Which way would her self-esteem go then? Down. Or she could say, Canfield has a perceptual handicap. He doesn't recognize good talent when he sees it. She'd probably stay the same. Or she might say to herself, you know, Jack probably picked me for this little demo because I'm in the front row, I'm very attractive, probably couldn't keep his eyes off me, and when it <laughs> did time to do this, I just jumped out at him, and he saw I have a little ego strength, I'm smiling at his jokes, he knows I could take a little teasing. Which way would her self-esteem go then? Go up. So it's not what I say to her, it's what she says to herself. It's not what the world does to you, it's how you respond. Now, I want to share one more story just to give you a sense of overcoming obstacles because too many of us think, well, yeah, that wouldn't work for me. Think about this guy. I have a friend named Roger Crawford. And Roger Crawford was born with one finger on his right hand. That's all he had. Now, on his left hand, he had a finger and a thumb. And his left leg had to be amputated from the knee down when he was about 11 years old. He was born with a disease called ectodactylism, which basically created problems with all of his limbs. Severely handicapped, they call it. So he decides he wants to grow up and be a football player. Because his dad said, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Roger, you decide what you want to go do. So Roger said, OK, I want to I play football. And so he went out, and his dad taught him how to block and tackle. He wasn't going to be the quarterback with one finger, right? Can't hold the ball. But he could play defense. And so he went out, and he played. And he had a dream one day. Can you hold this for me for one second? When I had this dream, and he went out, and his dream was that he would catch a ball 
intercept the pass, and run for a touchdown. Now here it is, the next to the last game he ever played. And the opportunity presents itself. Quarterback goes to throw a ball to a halfback in the flat. Rodgers guarding that halfback. He gets hit from behind, and the ball goes up, and it's at a higher trajectory than it's supposed to, and Roger can lunge for the ball and grab it, which he does. And he starts running toward his, the, the proper goal line. He gets six yards from his goal when someone grabs Roger's left leg. Now remember, Roger what? He's been amputated. He has a prosthesis. Grabs his left leg. Roger said, I pulled. He pulled. The leg came off, and I hopped on one foot. He said better than the six points was the look on the guy's face holding <laughs> this prosthetic device. Now, the next thing that Roger wanted to do, eventually his dad had been a tennis player, decided he wanted to play tennis too. So what do you do? How do you hold a racket with one hand? Obviously, you can't do that when you've got one finger. But eventually, he found out, remember Tim Allen, duct tape will solve anything? He took that silver tape and he wrapped it around his arm, and he could control that racket with that one finger with the duct tape. But if he didn't hit it right in the middle, it would wobble. Eventually, Wilson came out with one of these graphite rackets, and he could put his finger right here, and with his finger and thumb like this, he could totally control that racket. Roger went on to become captain of his high school tennis team, captain of his college team. They won the doubles championships, NCAA Western Regionals, with him on that doubles team. He said, I'd rather have three fingers and a positive attitude than five fingers on each hand, a total of 10, and a negative attitude any day of the year. He said, a positive attitude will win any time. And then he played John McEnroe. <laughs> and he said, sometimes you need more than a positive attitude. <laughs> so what do we see here? The power of our thoughts. Thoughts are so powerful. We never learned this in school. But the reality is what you think is what comes about. And so we want to get rid of all the negatives and focus on the positives. We want to start using affirmations. You want to read positive books. You can talk to yourself positively in the mirror before you go to sleep at night. Just try sometimes saying I love you to yourself in the mirror. And if you find that hard to do, then it's going to be hard for you to let other people's love in too. So let's jump into these six steps of success that we're talking about here. Step number one, you have to decide what you want. Now that sounds so obvious, but so many people go through life not being really clear about what their goals are, what their vision is, what their dream is. I have a cartoon at home that I have above my desk, and it's a cartoon of two spiders sitting at the end of a sliding board, you know, the kind the kids slide down. There's a big spider web across the place where the kids will come off. And one spider's looking at the other, and he says, you know, if we pull this off, we'll eat like kings. And even though it's a little gross, it makes a point that I want you to have a big vision, a big vision. I want you to go for everything that it is you want in life and to get in touch with that from your heart. See, we were told a lot of us, you can't have that, you can't do this. Forget all that. If none of that mattered and anything was possible, what would you want? So one of the phrases I have is ask what, not how. Because many of you don't know how you're going to get it. And if you don't see how you can achieve it, then you don't, you're afraid to commit to it. Well, I can't see how to have a perfect relationship with my husband, so I don't want to commit to that because I don't want to be a failure. I can't see how I could ever get medical school given the income we have, so I don't want to commit to that. What I'm going to teach you here is if you'll make the commitment and do these other steps that we're going to talk about, the how will show up along the way. See, in my ideal vision, there's no drive-by shootings in Los Angeles. In my ideal community world, there's no hunger. There's no illiteracy, there are no gangs. People say, oh, that's impossible. Well, it's only possible if we start to visualize it, decide this is what we want. And once we commit to it, as I said, the how will show up. And finally, are there any accomplishments you want to have before you die? Maybe you want to get that PhD, want to write a book or publish a letter to the editor in the newspaper or make that trip around the world, whatever it is for you. Now, don't let your mind tell you it's not possible. I want the inner child in you, you know, you know, the one that says, come on, mommy, I want to buy that. You go, we can't afford that, okay? I want the little kid in there that thinks anything is possible to decide what you want. And the spiritual part of this comes in, I believe, that in your heart, you really know what's for your highest good. And if you let yourself go there, then you're going to be lined up, the old not thy will, or not my will, but thy will. And so I want that energy to come through as your life purpose. And we can't go into that in like great depth in a small seminar here that we have in terms of time. But again, this is not about your ego needs. 
It's about what you really need to do to feel fulfilled, to feel filled full of yourself. And if you'll go there and trust yourself, then you get a level of satisfaction you can't believe. The last part of this is you've got to tell other people what your vision is. Now, a lot of teachers out there say, oh, don't tell people what your vision is because they'll rain all over your parade and you know, then you'll lose your enthusiasm. Remember, surround yourself with positive people. And if someone does rain on your parade, just say thank you for your contribution, right? Because they're doing the best they can to be of value to you. Maybe they think that you can't do it. Just say thank you. Move on. Go to someone else, okay? But as you start to share your vision and your dreams with others, some people are going to go, I have that same dream. You know, I'll help you. Martin Luther King stood up and said, I have a dream. And a lot of other people went, hey, I share that dream. Let me line up. I'll march with you. And eventually, some things started to happen in terms of fighting racism in our culture. But it had to be someone that stood up so other people could attract to it. And you'll be surprised who will become attracted to your dream. The second step to success that's so critical is you've got to set specific goals and objectives for your vision or your dream. It's a nice thing to say, I want a winter home in Hawaii. But that won't do it. It's got to be measurable. It's got to be in time and space. How much do you want and by when? Now let me give you a good example of this, why it's so important to make a list of goals. I tell people in my seminars, you want a goal or an objective, a measurable thing for every part of your vision, and I think you want to have 101 goals. I mean, really go for it. Now, John Goddard, who we wrote about in our first Chicken Soup for the Soul book, when he was 15, he set a list of 127 goals that he wanted to achieve. Now, he's sitting in his dining room with his dad, and all these people are coming over to dinner. These are the big successful people in town. And he's listening to him talk to his dad, who's a successful businessman, saying things like, you know, I wish before I'd started my business, I'd traveled around the world, because now it's too late. Or I wish I'd spent more time with my children. Or I wish I'd read the encyclopedia. Or I wish I'd learned music. I wish I'd learned to play an instrument. And he said, I don't want to live my life and get to 50, 60 and go, I wish I had. Or to live on what one of my friends calls Someday Isle, right? Someday I'll do this, someday I'll do that, and you never get there. And so he made a list of 127 goals. Now these were not minor goals. These were things like visit the Great Pyramid in Egypt, visit the Great Wall of China, visit the Vatican, meet the Pope, learn three languages, read the encyclopedia, shoot out a candle with a 22 rifle from 100 feet, fly an airplane, learn to, you know, control a boat, learn to type 150 words a minute, all these different things. And he's achieved 115 of those 127 goals. The last one he just accomplished was learning to play polo. Now the guy's in his 70s, and polo, I understand, is a pretty strenuous sport. In his polo class was Sylvester Stallone, the actor. What a neat, what a neat life. I mean, this guy's the real Indiana Jones, right? He's doing all this stuff out there. His next goal that he's training for is to, to start at the, the mouth of the Yangtze River or the beginning of it and sail all the way down, all the way through China. And he's getting ready to go do that. So he wakes up every morning and he knows exactly what he's working toward. He's got a blueprint for his life. What about you? Do you have a blueprint for your life? And if not, why not? Let's look at this idea of specificity for a minute. Like a winter home in Hawaii. Very nice. But if I say, I will own a two-bedroom beachfront fill on the west coast of Maui, Hawaii by June 1st, 2003, does that sound a little more clear? Yeah. And until you get specific like that, the creative part of your brain won't jump in and decide how to help you get there. And that's why a lot of people never get their dreams, because they don't make them specific enough. You got to get real nitty gritty, break it down. How much by when? I want a better relationship with my husband. Well, what does that mean? But if I say I want to spend an hour a week sitting opposite my husband talking about real things that matter, no TV on, eye to eye communication, now that we can measure. Did you do it for an hour? Want to have more fun. What does that mean? But what if I say I'm going to listen to comedy albums twice a week for a minimum of an hour? You're probably going to have more fun. So make it specific. Make it, make it real. Some people say, you know, I want our business to increase. Well, how much? By when? Want the reading scores to go up in a school. How much? By when? Until you have that, you're not going to make progress. And so many people's dreams never get completed because they're not clear about the specific number of how much by when. I told you earlier in the program, we said we're going to sell a million and a half books in a year and a half. And that directed our behavior. Recently, we just said we're going to sell a million books in one day. We had 101 bookstores involved in a book signing. 
I'm going to try to be in the Guinness Book of World Record for the largest book signing ever done. Now, I don't think we sold a million books. Maybe we sold a couple hundred thousand. But by holding that question and trying to figure out how to do it, it moved us toward that goal. Now, maybe it'll take us two years to figure out how to sell a million books in one day. But it gets the thinking to expand out into that arena. Is this making sense? Okay, so you want to have those goals. Now, the other thing you want to do is break your goals down. Many of you have big goals, end hunger in the world. That's a pretty big goal. You know, have world peace, achieve a certain level of spiritual oneness with God or life. Big goals. When you first look at it, it's kind of overwhelming. But what if we were to break that down into little steps? It says, okay, I want to go to college and get a PhD. Gosh, I'm only a high school student. But the next step would be, Finish the math class, get an A in this. Write for a brochure from a college, get a catalog. Pick one or five colleges that I want to apply to. You know, just keep breaking it down to little steps and then figure out how to get all those steps done and put a date by each step. And then start doing the plan. Someone said if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Some, one of my friends said success by the yard is hard, by the inch it's a cinch. So we just break it down into small pieces. I had, uh, I was reading the Guinness Book of World Records because we were thinking about being in there, and this guy set a goal to eat an entire bicycle. Oh. Tires and all. Now, how do you do that, right? Well, it took him 17 days. But what he did is he kept cutting the bicycle up and then melting it down into little swallowable pieces, and he ate them. I don't know how much stayed in, but he ate them, right? <laughs> but the point being, anything can be done if you break it down small enough. Make sense? So don't let the bigness of a goal overwhelm you. Now, finally, what's the purpose of all this? The purpose of all this is not to get the million dollars, the Rolls Royce, the best-selling book, all of that. That's nice. But have you ever known people that had all that and weren't really happy? And have you ever known people that had all that and then lost it? You know, Donald Trump was really wealthy for a while, and then he lost it, and now he's coming back and all that. Well, that happens. It's not the result that's important. It's who you become in the process of achieving the result. Jim Rohn said, set a goal so big that in the process of achieving it, you become someone worth being. Isn't that an interesting concept? Because it's not the result. If you set a big goal, three things are going to show up in your life. One is called considerations, all the thoughts about why it's not possible, all the fears that you have about going out there and doing that thing. And finally, there are real roadblocks out there in the world. There are laws and things that maybe that it's not legal to do that yet, or you know, it's not zoned for that, or all those kind of things. And you're going to have to learn how to overcome those roadblocks. And to learn how to quiet the considerations in your head, and learn how to overcome those fears. But have you ever done something that was really scary, and then the next time you did it, it wasn't quite so scary, and then the third time wasn't, and pretty soon it's no big deal. Like the first time I did TV, it was scary. Now it's not such a big deal. But you have to go through it. Right? And when you're done, you get to have something in your life called mastery. And that's the goal. The goal is mastery. Mastering your fears, mastering your thoughts, mastering your behaviors, so that you can do anything you want. That can't be taken away from you. A friend of mine's house burnt down. He was an, he was an author. He lost all his manuscripts, all his research, his computer melted, everything. Nothing was safe. And you would have thought maybe he'd have committed suicide at that point, but he didn't. What did he do? He said, look, Everything I learned about being an author is still in my head. You can't take that away from me. I know how to talk to editors. I know how to write. I know how to outline. I know how to write book proposals. I know how to go on talk shows. I'm no longer afraid of that. So what you want to do is create goals that are so big and so full of your heart that when you achieve them, even if you lose the result, the best-selling book, they always fall off the bestseller list. My publisher over here will tell you that. They just don't stay on there forever. But the reality is, you become a master in life. Now, step three is you've got to visualize the results that you want. This is probably the most important step of all the six steps. Maybe the second most important. It's one of the top two. What does that mean? You've all heard people say, visualize the goals if it's already achieved. Think about this. Have you ever known a kid, like a high school kid, he's into skateboarding or something, and you go into his room, and the whole wall is covered with pictures of skateboarding? It's like he's surrounding himself with this image of what he wants. People say, I can see it so bad, I can taste it. You ever heard that phrase? Yeah. Well, they, they literally can see it. And because they can see it, it creates something inside of them that moves them toward the goal. Let me demonstrate this with you. Could I have everyone stand up right where you are for a moment? And you at home, would you stand up too? 
Good. Now, we're going to do a little exercise that is intended to literally blow your mind, to open it up at such a level that you'll never be the same again in terms of this technique we're talking about. So what I'd like you to do is just watch me for a minute, and then we'll do it. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to put your right arm out in front of you and have your feet about 12 inches apart, nice solid stance. And then I'm going to ask you to turn as far as you can. And when you can't torque your body anymore, notice where your hand is pointing. Mine's right to the right-hand side of that pillar there. And then look to what's to the right and left. I see the blue window. I see the wall there with the painting on it. Get a clear picture and kind of lock that in like a photograph, OK? Pretend there's a little laser beam pointing off. Now, if you're turning here in the studio and there's somebody there, bend your elbow, keep turning. <laughs> Don't whack him in the head, but also don't stop. I want your turning to only be stopped by your inability to torque your body any further. Okay? Everyone ready to do this? Put your right arm up. And go ahead, turn as far as you can. And when you can't turn any further, notice where your hand's pointed. See what's to the right, what's to the left. Get a real clear picture. And then come on back to the middle. And lower your arm. Okay, good. Now, let me explain what happens here. You had in your mind an experience of reality called how far you went, right? And then I asked you to put a picture in, we'll call it the vision, of something you wanted, which was to go further, that you hadn't really experienced. And when you hold those two in your mind simultaneously, it creates something in the brain called structural tension. It's a mental tension. That mental tension wants to resolve itself can only resolve itself one of two ways. Either you give up on the goal, or the goal has to become real. Now, what happens in your brain when you do this, and you hold that structural tension? Remember we talked disciplines of success? This is something you do every day as a discipline. And when you do it, you visualize the goal you want is already achieved. And that structural tension makes three things happen. Number one, you start to perceive things out in the world that were always there, that can be resources to help you achieve your goals. Things that you just didn't even notice before, but they were there. Second, you're going to start getting creative ideas. Oh, I could do that. Third, you're going to feel motivated to take action. Now, this perception thing, how many of you have ever thought, gee, I'd like to go to Hawaii, and then you're at a party about three days later, and across the room, a room full of 100 people, you hear someone say, Hawaii. You ever had that experience? It's like the Red Sea parts, and you go walking. Did you say Hawaii? You know, you have a condo over there? Do you ever let people stay in it? You know, it's like, how do we do that? Well, the reticular system in our brain opens up, and we perceive more. Now, I'm going to demonstrate this to you very graphically here in the studio and at home on TV. And I want you to pay attention over here, if we could, to the monitor. And we're going to bring up a sentence on this monitor. And I'd like you to read this sentence with me out loud on the count of three. We'll all read it out loud. One, two, three. Finished files are the result of years of scientific study combined with the experience of many years. OK, then we'll take that off the monitor. And what I'd like, in a moment, we're going to put that back up. And when we put it back up, we're only going to leave it up for 10 seconds. And what I want you to do is count the number of times the letter F. F. How many times is F? appear in that sentence, OK? And don't say anything out loud. Keep it to yourself, and then we'll see what happens. So if we can bring that picture up again for 10 seconds. Go ahead and look. OK. Now, by show of hands, how many of you counted three Fs in that sentence? Can you raise your hands? OK. About a third of the audience. How many counted four Fs? One, two, three, four, about eight people. How many counted five Fs? About 12 people. How many counted six Fs? About seven people. How many people aren't going to raise your hand no matter what I ask? <laughs> Got you back there. OK, good. Now, first question, were we all looking at the same sentence or not? See, there is an objective reality out there. Let's take a look again, and let's see. Those of you that saw three, cent three Fs, if we look up on the monitor, are those the three you saw? Yes. yes? OK. And we can bring that off. And those of you that saw more, let's bring it up again. Now, if you look, there are six Fs underlined in that sentence. You hear that, oh. That's what we psychologists call the, oh my gosh, reaction, you know? OK, now, here's the deal. 
Just because you didn't see the extra Fs, does that mean they're not there? No, they're still there whether you see them or not. Do you think some people see more resources out in the world than you do? More solutions to problems? More entrepreneurial opportunities than maybe you do? More people that look friendly they can get a hug from? More money that's available for loan? See, everything's out there. All the solutions to your problems exist, but we don't see them. And partially we don't see them because we've never learned this concept of how to get our brain to open up and let this reticular system in the back, let that information in. Do you ever drive down a street and notice a house and go, where'd that come from? And your husband or wife goes, honey, that's been there for three months. You know? And literally you just didn't see it. It was like a blind spot. But what happens when you learn this technique, all of a sudden you start seeing more. 1983, the Australian sailing team had never won an America's Cup, ever. And the coach had a new idea. He said, let's try this visualization stuff. And he made a tape. And on this tape, he did a narration of the Australian team beating the American team. And it was something like, you know, we're going around the last buoy, we're three boat lengths ahead of the Americans. And they had all the sound effects in the background, the wind and the sails, and the water going by, and the little lines hitting the mast, and all that stuff that you associate with that. And this tape went on for about 20 minutes. It was a little faster than the actual race. And they would imagine beating the Americans. Now, he made the team listen to this tape every day, twice a day, for three years. Someone just said, oh my gosh. Now, when they finally went to race the Americans, it was like, not them again? <laughs> How many times do we have to beat these guys? It was like, of course we can beat the Americans. Their whole attitude was totally different. And in fact, they came in and they won the America's Cup. So the idea is that you can use this in any aspect of your life, whether it's sports, whether it's, you know, losing weight, whether it's getting better grades in school, learning to read, whatever. We've been talking about the power of visualization. And one of the stories that really drives home how powerful this is is a man named Patrick Taylor down in Louisiana decided he wanted to make a difference in his community. He was a self-made millionaire in the field of oil, and he decided he wanted to give back. And so he adopted a middle school in an inner city. And this is a school where the dropout rate was 86 percent. 86 percent of these kids never graduate high school. And what he did is he offered the kids a deal. He said, look, if you'll stay in school and you get a B average, and you have a 98% attendance record, which means you've got to come to school. I will pay for your college education. Now, this gave them a sense of belief and hope. But he, he was a sophisticated guy, and so was the school. They knew they had to do more than this, because you'd forget that after a while. So what they did is they took all the kids on a bus. They took them out to a university. And they had them shadow a student, which meant they followed them around for a day. They went to classes with them. They went to the gym with them. They went to lunch with them. They went to the student union. They went to the library, all the different places they would go. And at the end of the day, they picked the kids up and took them home. Now, for the first time in their life, these kids who had never seen anyone go to college had a picture in their mind of what it looked like to go to college. So when we're talking about visualizing the result as if it's already done, one of the things that you might want to do is go put yourself in the position of what it would look like to be there. W. Clement Stone said to me, go down to where all the guys get out of the stock exchange and get in the limos and go up and introduce yourself to them. Walk into the exchange, see what it's like, get a feel for it, get a picture in your mind. I tell people to go down to uh, the Rolls Royce place, if that's what you want to own, and sit behind the wheel and look your head out the window and wave. <laughs> take a camera with you, have the salesman take a picture of you, right? Take it home, blow it up to 8 by 10, put it on the refrigerator. Every day you see yourself in a Rolls Royce. Well, he had these kids every morning when they came to school, the teachers would have them close their eyes and visualize being on that college campus. Five years later, the dropout rate had gone from 86% down to 16%. It almost totally reversed itself. The power of a goal, the power of visualizing that goal. One of my friends is a woman named Glenna Salisbury. She's the president of the National Speakers Association. She tells the story of how she used this in her life. She was a person, she said, that was kind of down on herself at that time. Her dreams weren't all that coming true. She needed to rekindle some dreams in her life. And she had gone to a lecture and heard a man give a formula that said, I times V equals R. Imagery times vividness equals reality or results, either one. And so she said, I want that reality. And she went home from that lecture all excited. I hope you'll do the same thing tonight. And she took out a notebook. And she picked eight goals that she had for herself. And she took a picture out of magazines for each goal, and she pasted them in her notebook. One of them was a good-looking man. 
The second was a woman in a wedding gown and a man in a tuxedo because she wanted to get married. The third was bouquets of flowers because she's very romantic. The fourth one was beautiful diamond jewelry. Now, she's a very spiritual woman, but she said, Solomon had a lot of diamonds. Why not me? You know, he was in the Bible, right? <laughs> She saw an island in the Caribbean with a sparkling blue water, a lovely house, because she wanted to have a house. At that time, she didn't. She wanted to be in a house with all new furniture, so she visualized that, cut out the pictures for that. And finally, a woman who had recently become vice president of her company, because there were no women vice presidents in her company, and she wanted to be that. Now, eight weeks later, she's driving down a freeway. She's been looking at these pictures every day, closing her eyes, visualizing, just like we're teaching here. And she said, this guy pulls up in a Cadillac, it was a red Cadillac. She liked red Cadillac. She looked over. Guy smiled at her. She smiled back. And she said, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> he thinks it means something. So I speed up. He speeds up. I pull off to the right lane. He pulls over. I get off on the, on the exit. He gets off on the exit. She said, I pulled over and I stopped, thinking he'd go on by. He, stole, he stopped behind me. And she said, eight months later, we were married. Now, she's got the husband, right? His hobby was collecting diamonds. And he said he was looking for someone to decorate. The first week that he met her, he sent her a dozen roses. And then every week after that, I think he sent her a dozen roses, is what she said. Then she says, we got the honeymoon down where? He says, let's go to St. John's in the Caribbean. She says, I never would have thought of that. Right? <laughs> they had the tux and the wedding gown. She's got the gorgeous home with the furniture. Because guess what this guy did for a living? He was a distributor for one of the finest East Coast furniture manufacturers. And within a year, she was vice president of human resources for her company. Now, I could tell you a hundred stories like that because this thing works. You've got to use it, though. Now, let me tell you my own story just so you can get a sense of that. When I first learned this material, I was in Chicago working for this man I mentioned earlier, W. Clement Stone. And he said, well, actually, I wasn't working. I was taking seminars with him, just getting to a point where later I did work with him. And he said, I want you to set a goal that's so big that if you achieved it, it would blow your mind. And I said, what I want to do is I want to make $100,000 in one year. Now, I was a teacher in a public school making $8,000 a year, and I was getting $2,000 a year from this book I'd published as royalties, so I had $10,000 a year income. So this would be 10 times what I was making. I didn't see how that was possible, but I want to test the theory. So I said, that's my goal. And he said, here's what I want you to do. Go home, visualize the goal internally and externally. So I took a $100 bill, I added three zeros to it, basically, and then I blew it up, drew it, and put it on the ceiling. Every morning I wake up, first thing I see, $100,000 bill. Then I had a little affirmation, I said, God is my infinite supply and large sums of money come to me quickly and easily under grace for the highest good of all concerned as I easily earn and invest $100,000 a year. And then I would go to work. Now, nothing happened for about six weeks. And then I was in a shower, and I had my first $100,000 idea. My mind went, you have that book. You get a quarter every time that book sells. If you sold 400,000 copies of that book, you'd make $100,000. The book was called 100 Ways to Enhance Self-Concept in the Classroom. It was a book for teachers. Now, I didn't know how to do that, but at least I had something I could leverage. Now, how many of you have ever been in your grandmother's bathroom? Can I see a show of hands? What magazine would you find in most grandmother's bathrooms in America? Reader's Digest, that's right. And so I'm in my grandmother's bathroom, and I look over, and there's the Reader's Digest. Now, we talked about Fs earlier, all those Fs you don't see. And there was an F. It said 8 million readers in 17 languages. I thought, my gosh, if 8 million people read about my book, certainly they would run out and buy it, and I'd at least have 400,000 people that make my goal. So I called up the Reader's Digest. I said, I'd like to take an ad in your magazine. What's it cost? They said, you want to do it right? I said, well, I'm not interested in doing it wrong. And I said, what do you need to do is you need to have the right-hand placement, you know, not the, the right page, not the left. That's where the eye goes. It should be in color, not black and white. It'll stand out. Go all the way to the border instead of, you know, have a bleed, what they call it, so you don't see that white border around the edge. It's more graphic to the eye. He said, you better let us write the copy because you obviously don't know what you're doing. And I said, well, that's probably true. And he said, we should have six repetitions, six months in a row, because that's what will get that repetition factor going, and people will buy the book. I said, that sounds great. What will that cost? And he said, well, that'll run you about $108,000. <laughs> I said, well, we won't be doing that. He said, why not? I said, number one, I don't have $108,000. I'm a school teacher. And number two, even if I did the game I'm playing, I end up losing $8,000, right? <laughs> So I'm at the supermarket about a week later, and what do you think I saw at the checkout counter? The National Enquirer, that's right. 
It said 12 million readers weekly. Now there's another F. I'd seen the National Enquirer before. I'd seen the Reader's Digest before. But it had never like jumped out at me. It was in the background, like those Fs you didn't see. And all of a sudden, I call up the National Enquirer. I say, what about you guys? And their ads were equally expensive and just more than I could afford. But about six weeks later, I, I figured, well, use the technique. I started visualizing myself in a Reader's Digest, visually my, like, this, uh, easy to say with rented lips. I started visualizing myself in the, re, in the uh, National Enquirer. And all of a sudden, I'm at Hunter College giving a talk in New York, and this woman comes up, and she says, I'd like to interview you. I said, well, who do you write for? She said, I'm a freelancer, but mainly I write for the National Enquirer. And inside, I'm going, well, what took you so long, right? <laughs> well, she did the article. The book started selling more. And then my wife saw another F. She said, Jack, the bookstore sells the book for $6. They get to keep three of those. You only get a quarter. You should get more. Why don't we become a bookstore? I said, sounds like a good deal to me. So we started the mail order book service, selling one product, my book. And we had a little flyer we'd send out, and we'd take ads in parenting magazines. Well, then people started ordering the books, and my wife saw another F. She ordered something in the mail. Now, what do you get when you order something in the mail and you open up the box? Besides what you ordered, what else is in there? Catalogs and sheets of all kinds of stuff you can buy. And she said, look, we've already proven that they buy stuff through the mail on self-esteem. Let's send them more stuff to buy. So we started a little catalog. Eventually, it evolved into a 32-page catalog. We had over 100 products in it. And people started buying that stuff. Had to hire two high school kids to work after school to help us fulfill the orders. And finally, a lady came over from the University of Massachusetts. We were up in Amherst at the time. And she said, you know, we're having a counselor's conference. If you can bring all your books over, we'll give you two tables. You can sell your books and keep all the profit. We said, hey, sounds like a deal. Had a lot of counselors show up from all over the state of Massachusetts. And that weekend, we netted over $2,000. And I said to my wife, you know, if we could do that 50 weekends a year, that's $100,000 a year business. Now, we did not make $100,000 that year. I think our income was something like $96,253. Do you think we were really disappointed? <laughs> no, we were ecstatic. We were blown away. And then my wife says, honey, if it works for $100,000, do you think it would work for a million? And I said, I don't know. Let's try it. So we started. You can buy a million dollar bill, like in the stores, they have these little things you can get. And uh, we, we've got one. We blew that up and put that on the ceiling. And I started an affirmation, which is I am happily depositing my million dollar royalty check. At that time, I thought it was going to come from the Guthy Ranker Corporation, it does all those infomercials with Tony Robbins and other people. But it didn't. It came from a book, the first chicken soup book. About two years into that, my publisher, Peter Vegso, sends me a check for a million dollars. It was a million one hundred and thirty thousand six hundred and ninety one dollars, but who remembers exactly, right? <laughs> and it was so cute because he put a little smiley face in the signature, you know, for a million dollars. And that was really exciting. And I'm only sharing this with you, not to brag, but to give you the example of anything's possible. Now that didn't happen overnight. That took several years from the time we started visualizing that till we got it. Bigger goals take a little longer sometimes. But if you'll do the visualizing I'm talking to you about, you can have anything you want. I was watching TV up in Canada recently, and there was the Grey Cup, which is the Super Bowl of Canada football up there. And it was talking about a story about a guy who started missing all the passes they were sending him. And what the coach did is he took him aside and said, look, I want to show you a video of your 10 best passes, pass receptions that you ever did. And they made a little video of his 10 best pass receptions. And they asked him to watch that three times a day. And within three weeks, he was catching every ball. I think in that game, he caught two touchdown passes. So this stuff works, and it can be used in every aspect of your life. Whether it's internally, you do it by closing your eyes, or externally, you do it by putting a picture outside of you. So basically, this, the, the key here is repetition. Remember, discipline of success? You want to look at this every day. Put it somewhere you can see it, whether it's that picture of you in the car you want, or a picture of you. One friend of mine, she wanted to be thinner. She cut out her head from a photograph and put it on top of Christy Brinkley's body, okay? Yeah. Stuck it on the refrigerator. But this will work anywhere. Another friend of mine took the, um, his scale, and every time he looked down, whatever number was there, he didn't like it, right? He wanted to be like 30, 40 pounds lighter. So he took his ideal weight, let's say it was 185, and he got a piece of paper, wrote 185 on it, and glued it down over the top of the scale. So every time he stood on it, what did he weigh? 185. 
And what does he say to himself? Wow, I weigh 185. And that literally begins to create the structural tension that creates all the things we talked about and moves you toward the goal. Okay, let me demonstrate to you more than anything I, c I can think of, the best way to do it, the next step. Step number four. Because it's really critical that you get this. All these steps kind of have to happen together. All right? And this could probably be the most important one. The one that if you were to do this alone and pay attention to the feedback would probably get you where you want to go. I have here in my pocket, I believe, a $50 bill. If this $50 bill were available, and it is, I'm going to show you the one secret that separates winners from losers more than anything else, okay? So if this was available, who would want it? Thank you. All right, now don't go away yet. Come back. Tell us your name. Debbie. What did Debbie do that no one else in the audience did? She got up and she took action. See, too many times we sit around and we wait and we hope and we dream and we affirm and we pray and we meditate and we do all that. And all that's important. It's part of the process. But at a certain point, the opportunity shows up. And if you don't act, you get to sit and not have $50. Okay? So let's give her a hand for coming up here and doing it. So step number four is what? Take action. Take action. One of my favorite quotes is by Henry Wardsworth Longfellow. He said, the heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they while their companions slept were toiling upward in the night. What does that mean? You gotta work. You gotta do some doing this. You can't just sit around and hope it'll happen. One of the steps, one of the actions you need to take is called asking. And many of us, see we wrote a book, Mark and I wrote a book called Dare to, uh, Dare to Win. And it was a book of all these kind of things, and people went out and they read the book, and still a lot of people weren't successful. And we thought, what's the problem here? And as we began to analyze and interview people, we realized one of the main things that was blocking most people was the fear of asking for what they wanted. They wouldn't go up and just say, can I borrow money? Will you support my dream? Will you volunteer for school? Will you lend me your car? Whatever it is they need, they were so afraid of being rejected. And so we wrote a book called The Aladdin Factor, How to Ask for and Get Everything You Want. And we were doing all that research, we ran across a girl named Marquita Andrews. And Marquita Andrews was the living example of what we call ask, 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 ask. Because you're going to have to ask a lot of people. And Marquita, her mother, when she was a little girl, came up to her and said, you know, Marquita, I have a dream. My dream is to travel around the world, but I also have a dream for you. I want you to graduate college. Problem is I'm a waitress. I don't see how I can underwrite both dreams on a waitress's salary, but I'll make a deal with you. If you'll go to college and agree that after you graduate, you'll take 25% of your income for the first number of years and put that in savings to send me around the world, then I'll pay for your college education. But if you're not willing to do that, then I don't know if I want to pay for your college education. Well, what is she? She's like seven or nine at the time. She goes, sure, deal, you know? Well, later that year, she joins the Brownie Scouts. And the Brownies are part of the Girl Scouts, and they came out with their annual cookie drive. And they had a contest that year. Girl who sells most cookies wins trip for two around the world. Marquita says, I'm getting out of this one easy. Right? <laughs> so she starts selling cookies like you can't believe. Now, in her first year as a Brownie Scout, she sold 3,526 boxes of Girl Scout cookies. Someone just said, no way. <laughs> most women who've sold Girl Scout cookies, if you sell three or 400 boxes, that is a big deal. 3,526. How'd she do it? Ask, 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 ask. She lived in New York, high population concentration, right? She would go into high-rise apartment buildings and condos, and as people would come down in the morning and back from work, she would just be there. Did you buy your cookies yet? Did you buy your cookies yet? Well, you want to buy some cookies? And if she bought one, they say, well, you want to buy two? Don't you know people? She would just ask, ask, ask. Then one day, she finds herself at 14 years old. She wrote a book called How to Sell More Cookies, Condos, Cadillacs, Computers, and Everything Else. And she was the keynote speaker at Radio City Music Hall to the million dollar round table of insurance salesmen, all people who'd sold over a million dollars in commissions and all this stuff. And she's up there talking to a thousand people. At the end of her talk, she says, I want you all to look under your seat. You'll find a three by five card. Take that out and write a number between five and 10 on the card. So everybody did. And she said, that's how many boxes of Girl Scout cookies I want you to buy for me today as you leave here. <laughs> 
That day, she sold 7,000 boxes of Girl Scout cookies. She's in the Guinness Book of World Records. Before she retired, she sold over 32,000 boxes. Isn't that astounding? Hasn't been beaten yet. Okay. But what does she do? Ask, 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 ask. Very powerful tool. Now, she had one final clause, a little phrase she says, SW, 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 SW. What does that mean? Some will, some won't. So what? Someone's waiting. So if you ask enough people, eventually someone's going to say yes. If I asked everyone in this room, do you have a red car, eventually someone would say yes. It doesn't matter. If you ask enough people, you're going to get your dream met. And here's the, here's the word. It's very simple. When someone says no to you, what I want you to say to yourself real loud inside your head is the word next. Let's just practice that. So if I say no, what are you going to say? Yes. Absolutely. One more time. No. Yes. Now, what does that mean? Ask somebody else. Absolutely. How many people live on the planet? Five billion people. Someone wants to do what you want to do. Someone wants to get involved in your dream. Someone wants to support you. Some, you might have to ask a lot of people. Remember, ask, 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 ask. So when they say no, you say next. And here's another clue most people don't realize. If you ask somebody and they say no, does that mean you can never come back and ask them again? No. Little kids are so good at it. Mommy, can I go to the store with you? No. Oh, come on, Mom, please let me go to the store with you. They go away. Mom, you, you are going to let me go to the store with you. And they wear you down, you know? So that's another thing you can, next time can be, right? So don't let no stop you. No just means get creative, get, get going. Now, what stops people from asking? What stops people from doing? It's something called fear. We're all afraid. We're afraid we're going to look stupid. We're afraid we're going to get rejected. I love this person who did the acronym F-E-A-R. stands for fantasized experiences appearing real or false evidence appearing real. Because when you close your eyes and you fantasize something like you're not going to be able to pay your bills or they're going to take your house or you're going to flunk out of school, then your body reacts like it's real. I was flying to Orlando in a plane not too long ago and this woman was sitting next to me and as we took off, she started like lifting herself out of the seat. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm making myself lighter so the plane will take off. <laughs> now, I knew we'd had a failure in American physics education, right? And I also noticed her, her knuckles were all white. And I said, are you a little afraid? She says, yeah, I guess I am. I said, well, where are you headed, Orlando? I guess that's where I'm going. You're going. She says, yeah. I said, where are you going down there? So I'm going to Disney World to visit my children. They're going to be there and my grandchildren. I said, well, close your eyes for a second. Indulge me. I'm a psychologist. She said, okay. So she closed her eyes. I said, what are you imagining right now? She said, well, I see the plane blowing up in a fireball at the end of the, <laughs> the runway. I said, well, no wonder you're scared. You know, this would make anyone crazy. And so then I had her close her eyes and imagine being at Disney World. And I said, what's your favorite attraction? She said, it's a small world. So I said, imagine you're in the little thing and you're going through it's a small world and all the little people are dancing and singing. I actually started going, it's a small world. Anyway. <laughs> da, da, da. And all of a sudden she relaxed, her breathing deepened. And this was what was so powerful. Nothing outside of her had changed. We're on the same plane, going down the same wrong way. But what she changed was her response. She started visualizing a positive outcome rather than a negative outcome, and her physiology reacted. Same thing we've been talking about all along. Now, let's look at this fear. The biggest fear, I think, that stops most people from asking is the fear of what? Rejection. Rejection. So let's say that I ask, what's your name? I go over to Susan. I say, Susan, would you have dinner with me tonight? And let's say she says no. I go, oh. Everyone goes, oh, Jack's been rejected. It's so sad. But let's look at it objectively. Did I have anyone to eat dinner with before I asked her? No. Did I have anyone to eat dinner with after I asked her? No. Did my life really get worse? No. Stayed the same, right? If I apply to Harvard and don't get in, wasn't in Harvard before I applied, I'm not in Harvard after I applied. <laughs> and most of you have spent your whole life not going to Harvard and survived just fine, right? So it's not a big deal. I worked for a optical company that makes lenses. Half the lenses in your glasses, they have 50% of the market, so half of you are wearing them. And uh, I was the first guy that ever brought in as an outside speaker for their sales meetings. And I got there early in the day, and I went out, and there were some guys golfing and stuff. And I went up to people, and I said, do you know who the top two or three uh, performers in the company are? And they'd all go, oh, yeah, it's Bob and Mary and Joe. And I said, well, great. 
Well, that night I went into the group, it was about 300 people, and I said, do you all know who the top three performers in the com company are? And everyone said, oh yeah, it's Bob, Mary, and Joe. I said, so you all know who's like selling many, many, many millions of dollars more than you are? And they went, oh yeah. I said, now, by show of hands, how many of you have ever gone up to them and asked them to show you what they do to sell so much? You know, not one hand went up in that room of 300 people. Isn't it interesting? They knew who had the information, but they wouldn't ask them. I said, well, why don't you ask? Well, they might not tell me. I say, well, you already don't know. So if they don't tell you, <laughs> you still don't know. How'd it get so bad? You know, it's not so bad. But they were so afraid that they might say, oh, you're stupid, I don't want to share with you. And what I found, and I think most of you have probably found too if you test it out, most people are willing to share what they know. They like to teach, they like to share, they like to be a mentor. Not everyone will, but if they say no, what are you going to say? Next, there's lots of top performers out there you can go to. We've got to get over this fear of rejection. Don't let it stop you. It's not a big deal. Just keep asking the questions. Ask, ask, ask. Say next. Move on. Nothing happens if you're rejected. Fear of rejection. Fear of failure. Fear of looking stupid. Fear, 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 fear of stopping us. Let's look at how to overcome any fear. There's a couple different techniques, but let's look at what I think is probably one of the most powerful ones. How many of you have seen the book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway? Remember that? Susan Jeffers wrote this book. Well, think about that. Feel the fear and do it anyway. I'm going to do a little demonstration with you here to show you how this works. I'm going to take this chair here. I'm going to pretend this is a diving board. I'm going to stand up on the end of the diving board. How many of you know how to dive off a diving board? Can you remember when you had to learn to do that? You're standing on the end of the board. So here I am. I'm on the end of the board. There's my dad down in the water. He says, come on, jump. And I'm, dad, um... He says, it's only two feet to the water. I says, yeah, but it's another nine to the bottom of the pool. <laughs> and it's five from the feet to the head here, you know, and I'm, it's a long way down. He says, come on, just jump. I'm scared. Can you relate to that? How many of you at that point said, you know, Dad, I think I'm going to get off the board, go see a child psychologist, <laughs> going to deal with my fear of jumping into liquids from high places, and when I handle that, I'll come back and jump in. Did any of you do that? No, what did you do? You felt the fear and you jumped anyway, right? And this is really the principle that works for anything in life. You're gonna feel fear, it's gonna show up, so what? Most people let fear stop them. They say, well, obviously then I shouldn't do this thing. I'm gonna say to you, feel the fear and pretend it's like a two-year-old. Take the two-year-old with you. You know, it doesn't wanna go certain places, first day of school, so what? Take it, you're the adult. Treat your fear like a little child. But don't let it run you. You're bigger than that. You're bigger than that. The mastery comes from what? Handling the fear. Which leads us into step five, which says respond to feedback. See, when you take a first action, is that necessarily going to be the right one? No. But you can't get feedback unless you take the action. And some of us are so afraid of doing the wrong thing, we wait until like 18 doves fly over our house in the sign of a cross. Oh, it must be the ideal auspicious day. And then we take action. Well, they don't fly over that way too often, right? So we just have to take an action and see what happens. Now, there's two kinds of feedback. What are they? Positive and negative. Which one do you like best? Positive. Right. Positive feels good, right? You know you're on track. But have you ever had negative feedback and it was valuable? Yes. Right. So there's two kinds. Now, how many of you actively solicit feedback in your life? You say, hey, I want feedback on how to be a better parent or a better teacher or how can I be a better salesperson? How can we serve your company better? Right? Most people don't ask for feedback. Why don't they ask? They don't want to hear it. But let's say you're a teacher in school and you don't ask feedback. How I can be a better teacher. And the kids go home. Do you think they're talking about how you can be a better teacher? Oh man, that teacher, she doesn't let us do this, and she's so mean, and yada yada. Well, everyone in town knows but you. Everyone's talking about it. You're the only one not in on the secret. If you're not getting along with your wife, she's called her girlfriend, her mother, her sister, <laughs> told the people in the office, everything that's wrong with you. But guess who she hasn't told, perhaps? You. So it's very important to ask for feedback. So the key here is to what? Ask for feedback 
And when you get it, listen to it, then correct, and keep moving toward your target. Step number six, the last step, perseverance. Keep on keeping on. Never give up. Never give up. If you've got a goal that's important in your heart, don't give up. As I said earlier, we would have self-published our book if no one else would have published it. You've got to have that kind of commitment to your goals. You may not know this, but the average millionaire in America goes bankrupt three and a half times before they become a millionaire. I don't know how you go bankrupt a half a time, but you, you can do that statistically. <laughs> Walt Disney went bankrupt five times. Henry Ford went bankrupt three times. Remember, we did Chicken Soup for the Soul. 133 publishers said no. When they did, the guy that wrote the book, MASH, that became a TV show, it took him seven years. He was a high school teacher. He wrote at night. Remember, persevere a little bit every time. Break it down. Every night he wrote. What happened? Turned down by 18 publishers until Morrow bought the book. Jonathan Livingston Seagull, turned down by 19 publishers. Louis L'Amour, the great author, has 200 books in print. Got 300 rejections before he ever sold a piece of writing. Alex Haley, who wrote Roots, got a rejection slip every week for four years. 200 rejections before he sold his first piece of writing. See, it takes perseverance. Fred Astaire goes in for his first screen test. What do they say? Can't act. Bald. Dances a little. He had that framed in his living room after he went on to become what? one of the greatest dancing actors, singers we've ever seen in our history. You don't let other people determine. You persevere. You hang in there. So if you'll make your dreams a priority, and if you'll surround yourself with positive people, if you take 100% responsibility for your life and decide exactly what you want, and set specific goals and objectives, and visualize your goals as already completed, take massive and repeated action to respond to feedback, make corrections, on course, off course, and never give up, and I promise you, you'll start to live an amazing life full of dreams come true. Now, let me end with one story. One story that captures it all for me. It's about a little boy, six years old. His name's Robert. His mom calls him Bobsy for short. He's in his room one night. He wakes up. He's got a pain. His mom comes running in. He's crying. She does everything she can to get rid of the pain. Nothing works. So she takes him down to the hospital in Phoenix, and they do a series of tests, and they come back, and they, she was told something no mother ever wants to hear. Your son has leukemia. We think it's too far progressed to do anything about it. It's terminal. All we can do is make him comfortable. She said, how long does he have to live? She said, maybe six weeks, maybe six months. We don't know. Now, she believed in all the kind of things we've been talking about in this program. And she went to her son, Bobsy, and she said, Bobsy, the doctors say you only have maybe six months to live. You're only six years old. What did you want to do when you grew up? We're real curious, your dad and I. He said, Mom, I wanted to be a fireman more than anything else. And through the Make-A-Wish Foundation, she went to the fire department and said, I've got this little boy. He wants to be a fireman. He's not going to live. Could you let him ride on a fire truck or something like that? And they said, oh, look, lady, we'll do better than that. We'll make him chief of the Phoenix Fire Department for a whole day. Wow. She said, if you'll get the, the police, the chief said, if you'll get his measurements, we'll make a uniform for him. And they made one for him. And they gave him a hat that said chief. They picked him up the following Wednesday on a hook and ladder truck, and they drove him down, and he got to sit in the back by the big, big, big steering wheel with a guy named Fireman Bob, which is his same name. And that day, they went out on three fire calls, and Bobsy went out on all three. And they weren't pejorative. They weren't condescending. They said, look, here's what we normally do. What do you think? And he'd say, sounds good. Do it. <laughs> and he was real excited. He got home that night. He saw himself on TV because they were taking pictures of this kid. He was really excited. His dream had come true. Now what happens? Six months later, all the vital signs begin to wane. And the head nurse believed in something called the hospice movement. No one should die alone. And so she called up the mother and she called up the relatives and said, can you make it on down? We don't think Bobsy's going to make it through the night. Then she remembered the chief of the fire department. She called him up and said, do you think you could come over? Maybe a uniformed fire person could come and just stand by his bedside as he makes the transition because we want him to remember that best day in his life when his dream came true and he got to be a fireman. And the chief said, look, lady, we'll do better than that. We're going to be there in six minutes. We're coming in by hook and ladder. And they knew where his window was because they'd been there before to visit him. And they came in with that hook and ladder truck and up goes the ladder and extends to the third floor open window. And 14 firemen and firewomen climb up that ladder into his room. And with the parents' permission, they pick up this little boy and they start to rock him. And Bobsy looks up at the chief who was there and he says, Chief, does this mean I'm a real fireman? And he looked down and he said, Yes, Bobsy, you're one of the best firemen we ever had. And with that, he took his last breath, made his transition. Now, why would I end with that story? Because this is why. 
Everybody in his life conspired to what? Make his dream come true. To let him know that he was lovable and that his dream was worthy of support. Now here's what I want you to take away from this. Tonight, you're going to be in front of your mirror. And you're going to be brushing your teeth. And you're going to be looking into your eyes. There's a little pair of eyes looking back behind your eyes. It's the little bopsy that lives in you. Make sure that you don't let that child in you die without his or her dreams coming true, just like we didn't let little bopsy die without his dreams coming true.